Hello Retro Gamers and welcome to another modding video. Today we're installing a mod chip for the N64 that enables RGB video. As most of you probably know, the N64 stock off the shelf is only capable of composite video, which is very blurry and murky in the modern day, especially on modern televisions. With this mod chip supplied by a lovely, well, I've never met him, I just assume he's a lovely man called Etim, who's also an Australian, it enables the N64 to have RGB video out. And that's really all there is to say about that. It's quite straightforward, actually. The great thing about this mod is that you can just use a standard RGB cable in the standard video out slot on the back. So there's no modifications of the case whatsoever. That wouldn't really be an issue for this particular N64 though, because this is the same N64 from a few videos back that was rescued from a wet and vacant lot that was full of water, completely smashed, which I refurbished maybe four or five videos ago now. So very often a free N64 falls into my lap. This is a mod I've been wanting to do for a long time, so I thought the time was right. Got a few other things planned for that N64 for the future, but we don't have to talk about that today. For now, without further ado, let's get into installing the RGB mod chip. As much as I would have loved for this to be a sponsored video, unfortunately I had to pay for this myself. So there's just a little disclaimer to begin with. I'm not affiliated with Etim at all. I am just a customer like the rest of us. As of filming, this can be bought from his website, which is etim.net.au for 55 Australian dollars. There is however an American distributor as well. So if you still want this and you're in the States, it just costs a little bit more at 70 Australian dollars. And here's the package. Jeez, that was quick. Inside we get lots of loose sheets from a spotlight catalog, which is very much appreciated, as well as the mod chip itself and a length of multi-strand wire. All right, let's pull that N64 out of retirement. I would highly recommend the video where I restored this if you haven't already seen it. It's probably one of the coolest projects I've done in a while. Before we bust out the soldering iron, however, let's sit down and play some games. The purpose of this is to record using the native composite output, with the purpose of that being that we can then compare this to the RGB video output at the end and see how much it has improved. Now that that's done, let's start by preparing the wire. There'll be another bunch of wires which I'll show you later in the video, but for now we need 12 altogether. This is a bit of a laborious task, but I started by stripping each individual wire and then pre-tinning them. This took a while, but after a bit of work, I had both ends trimmed and tinned. Those 12 wires are for the chip's input, while we need to do the same thing with six wires for the output. And just so we're clear for this installation, we're following the official instructions on eTim's website. You can find that linked below. Now that we're done with the wiring for now, let's start by disassembling the N64. These are game bit screws, so you will need a special Figma bob for those, but they can be found quite easily and cheaply online. So those five screws get removed, and it's also at this point I remove the expansion pack, as it holds the two parts of the case together. This is achieved by using a flat-headed screwdriver. Once we're inside, the next step is to remove the heatsink. There is quite a few screws for this, and fortunately they are Phillip head, but luckily we don't have to remove them all. Here's a photo from the official instructions, detailing which ones need to be removed, so the whole thing can come out as one piece. And there we go, easy peasy. All the input wires run from the video encoder DAC IC. There are four different types of these over all the different revisions of the N64. And it's worth checking what you have before you buy this because you may need a separate adapter. This is what that looks like because the pin spacing on those are so close together. But fortunately for me, I have one of the ones that doesn't require the pin adapter, which you can hand solder. So I started by pre-tinning the relevant pins on this IC and I thought I'd be smart about it and do it all in one go. But I pretty much immediately regretted this. This was not a good idea. So I pulled out the braid and attempted to remove it. But this small tip wasn't really getting the job done. So I didn't film it, but I have a bigger tip. And I got rid of all the excess solder pretty much in one go. And here's what it looks like with everything cleaned up and pre-tinned. Much nicer. I also checked all the pins with a multimeter just to make sure there was no bridging between them. And now it was time to solder one wire to one pin. This was as fiddly as it looks and a little bit messy. But after a sore neck later, everything was done and amazingly, there were no bridges between any of the pins, which just blows my mind for a first go. Probably more dumb luck than anything. And once everything soldered and confirmed to be going where it needs to, the instructions say to fold the cable over like this. 
And now it's time to solder the other end of those 12 wires to the mod chip. There are three different rows of pads, depending on which IC you have. My N64 has the D, E, N, C, so I pre-tinned that row of pads. And just like before, all those wires need to be soldered to the pads. Again, this was a little bit tricky, but certainly not impossible. It's kind of hard to see here, but unfortunately I did clip the blue wire a little bit shorter than the others, so it didn't quite reach. So to remedy that, I cut the leg off some random component and just used that to extend the wire. Yay, problem solving. So with the input all sorted, it was now time to deal with the output. Those six wires go from the chip to a couple of points on the board close to the video output. Here's another screenshot from the instructions illustrating that. So I gave that area of the board a bit of a clean with IPA and then reflowed the points just so it'd be a bit easier to solder the wires to them. And just so I didn't wire up anything wrong, I did write myself a little list with what color wire was associated with which color channel. It would have been nice to use the correct color wire, but I just used what I had on hand. This video is sponsored by Patagonia. Ha, <laughs> nah, just kidding. And with that wiring figured out, the last thing to do was solder those wires to the correct output tabs on the mod chip. Very simple. Now is a good time to give it a test before properly installing the chip in the case. For my video output, I'm using a very simple and cheap RGB cable, one that's very common that you can buy online, and that simply plugs into my OSSC, which then outputs HDMI. To begin with, I couldn't actually get it to work. I thought I must have wired it up wrong. But fortunately, it was actually the game cartridge causing that, so after cleaning the cartridge and reinserting it, I got a signal. It appears to work. Fantastic. Let's finish off this installation. The installation instructions recommend bending back this tab on the RF shield. This is so the 12 strand wire can easily be channeled around the case. This can be a little bit fiddly as well, just wrapping the wires around and such. But the idea is that the mod chip goes on top of the heatsink and there's a bit of adhesive that can be pulled off to stick it into place. However, before I did that, I just performed another test just to make sure that none of the wiring had been compromised. And I'm very sorry for this very awkward camera angle, but it showed that everything was working. So let's pull off that adhesive. This adhesive is heat resistant, so even though it is mounted to the top of the heatsink, it should stay in place. The last bit of wiring is just a better ground connection. You just want to completely strip a wire, solder it to the ground tab, and then wrap it clockwise once around the closest screw. It should look something like this. So we'll just do another quick test here just to make sure that everything is still working. And because it appears to be, let's put the case back on. And with that, it is time to now do some more testing. I played the same scenes from the same game, and I want you to let me know what you think of the image quality. Does it look improved to you? It certainly looks improved to me, especially when you compare the text. With composite, it is a bit more blurrier and fuzzier, and also the colors are just a bit more, I don't know, subdued. But for the RGB, it really brings out all the colors and just makes everything a lot more crisper. The OSSC is probably helping as well, but this is the only way I can test the cable because it's quite literally the only thing I have that has a SCART input. SCART wasn't very common in Australia. Unfortunately, we just had composite and basically then went straight to HDMI. So the OSSC is realistically the only way I can test this. I just want to add a quick note about the cable as well. It is suspiciously cheap. So, and I don't really know too much about RGB yet. It's a subject I'm delving into as we speak. But if you're in the know in the comments and you can recommend a fantastic RGB cable for the N64, by all means, please let me know. I bought this one because it was cheap and be good for testing, but I'm more than happy to take advice on these cables as I really want the best of the best, especially when I start reviewing games and start capturing footage. Either way, that is the end of this installation. As you can see, it is quite simple, but does require a bit of soldering. But if you can hack that, this is a great way to get RGB from your N64. Thank you so much for watching and apologies for my gravelly voice this video. I have been a bit ill this week, but hopefully that didn't bother you too much. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.